For today's video, I've decided I would cease my rhyming and extend the length of my video to usher in the eighth day of our theology series with the topic of religious theological viewpoints of economic development and socio-economic organization. This video will look at the influence of four different theological worldviews. Let's start with the Hellenist philosophers. While I am sure there were a plethora of philosophical viewpoints at this time extolling many different economic virtues as well as vices, I wish to focus on two philosophers, namely Aristotle and Plato. Even though they are not titled with a specific religious tradition, this comes down to two reasons. One, they are indirectly tied into the topic for their direct influence over Christian theologians, and two, they are the earliest exemplars of thought with regards to our modern viewpoints of economic theory. To start with Plato, we can consider him as one of the major forerunners of utopian thought within the West. His major contribution to political economic organization was his opus, the Republic. Plato believed that a society would be best served if all of its resources were run by a group of elite philosopher kings, delegating over soldiers, the second highest order, and the common man, who was at the bottom of the rung. Plato opposed both private property, believing it would lead to an individual over common good, and usury, or putting interest on money. The Republic went on to influence the famed Christian theologian, St. Augustine, who wrote The City of God. So popular was Plato among Christians that they perpetuated, according to Augustine at least, that his wisdom was partially due to his personal relationship with the prophet Daniel of the Old Testament. Augustine himself used the Republic as a springboard for describing the heavenly Jerusalem that God will bring about, serving as an early example of separating religious elements from secular ruling governments. In Islam, the effect was of the reverse order. The eminent philosopher Abu Nasr al-Farabi was inspired by the Republic to create his own, more Islamicized version of it, the virtuous city. In his scenario, the philosopher king would be replaced by the first chief, who was a mystic able to communicate with the divine, and a lawgiver and establisher both secular law and religious law to the state. These viewpoints would later go on to influence the Ayatollah Khomeini in his Islamic Republic within Iran during the revolution of the 1980s. The second philosopher to contribute to the field was Aristotle, who like his teacher Plato agreed that usury was bad, but accepted and defended private property using arguments that many libertarians use today. For example, the notion that one ignores communal property but takes care of his own property even better. Not to mention he would also use his metaphysical arguments to prove that it is within human nature to be territorial and thus good. It is just human wickedness that generates its misuse. These notions go would go on to influence Christianity through St. Thomas Aquinas, as well as more secular philosophers like that of John Locke, and it would later go on through Locke to influence American legal philosophy. Whereas Christianity and Islam have had Aristotle and Plato to give philosophical influence, the religious traditions of Judaism are fairly obvious in both faiths, in terms of their monotheism, and in terms of their heritage of prophethood. It was considered to be a religion whereas usury was also considered wrong. However, unlike Islam or Christianity, usury was considered chargeable to outsiders. Now, whereas Aristotle and Plato may have given their philosophical justifications for not allowing usury, it was only until the doctrine supplemented by Judaism where such defenses had to be also given. The Old Testament also structures in socio-economic thought as well, in terms of how Israel was organized according to the Bible. In the early days, Israel was ruled by a priestly class of judges, similar to Al-Farabi's The Virtuous City. It was not until the prophet Samuel, whereby the socio-economic structure became a monarchy, although the economic dangers of such a system were indicative by the sayings of the prophet Samuel, who said, if you have a king ruling over you, this is what he shall do. He will take away your sons and force them to serve him, and he will force them to be his soldiers. They must fight from his chariots and become horse soldiers in his army. Your sons will become guards running in front of the king's chariots. A king will force your sons to become soldiers. He will choose which one of your sons will be officers over a thousand men and which will be officers over fifty men. A king will force some of your sons to plow his field and gather his harvest, and he will then force your sons to make weapons for war and make things for his chariots. A king will take your daughters and force them to make perfume and cook for him. 
A king will take your best fields and vineyards and olive groves, and he will take them from you and give them to his officers, and he will take one-tenth of your grain and grapes, and he will give them to his officers and servants. A king will take your men, women, and servants, and he will take your best chattel and your donkeys, and he will use them for all his own work, and he will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will be slaves of this king. When that time comes, you will cry, because the king you chose, but the Lord, he won't answer you. That speech was quoted by Thomas Paine in his work on Common Sense, a work that would later go on to inspire American revolutionaries during the Revolutionary War. Within the rabbinic schools, there were two interpretations, one looking favorably on Saul, the monarchical school, and the other agreeing with Thomas Paine more or less, the Republican school. While I already covered Christianity's influences through its philosophical and religious roots, I wish to cover a bit more here. In the ancient church, there were two schools that could also be characterized as monarchical and republican. To begin with the first, in the eastern church, the connection of the church to the state was for the church to be the priest of the state, giving its blessings whenever it could, and the state to act as its protecting soldier. The emperor of the eastern Roman Empire would select the church's patriarch and be the exemplar of faith for his people. So well regarded was the monarch, St. Gregory of Nicaea likened the system to the supreme good of monotheism while democracy as polytheism and anarchy was as atheism. The church could only protest in the face of heresy, as was done under iconoclasm and monotheism. In the West, thanks to the sacking of Rome, the church was more separate. Christians, under the theology of Augustine in the City of God, were like an exile in a land they were not a citizen of. Rather, they were a citizen of the City of God, awaiting the return of their leader. In the meantime, they are there to act as exemplars of both cities. Augustine and Aquinas went on to influence Protestant thinkers. John Calvin and Martin Luther were amongst them. They held that those in the Republic of God were to be the best citizens if they were really part of the elect, ready and designated to be members of the church. John Calvin went on to defend usury and also went on against the traditional Catholic stance. The Puritan work ethic was born and was inspired by Calvin's theology, and it was called, well, the Protestant work ethic, by the sociologist Max Weber. This shift in attitude was rather positive, as before, usury was considered something that Jews would have to do on behalf of Christians because they, in European land, were able to essentially charge interest, which was fairly good to the governments of these places. In fact, so helpful was this that Jews, if they wanted to convert to Christianity, would have to pay a tax. But if we want to continue about usury, the next best subject is Islam. As is in the Islamic system, Usury is still something Muslims are forbidden to do, as it is considered haram, or forbidden. Islam is the best modern-day example of how religion can directly influence economic organization. This is why I will not be looking at the history of Islam, as I have been, with Christianity, Judaism, and Hellenism. In Islam, like the above faiths, usury is not considered a good thing. In the Quran, it states in Surah 3, verse 130, O you who believe, you shall not take usury, compounded over and over. Observe God that you may succeed. In the Middle East, Islamic banking is influenced through Islamic theology, and the state tries to construct Islamic-friendly banking. Rather than charging interest, for example, these banks might buy the property on behalf of the consumer and resell it in small payments over time at a greater price, and those using the house might pay a user fee in exchange. This concludes Day 8 of our 12 Days of Theology. If rhymes you want, then ask for more. If you want more information, click the link to carnades.org.